Hi everybody. Um, thank you so much for making time to come to my talk. I'm really excited to have this platform to share with you all some of my recent work and the things I've been thinking about and to begin and continue a discussion about plant genomics. So I've divided my presentation today up into two main sections. In the first part of this talk, I'm going to give a broad overview of sort of the state of the field of plant genomics based on a recent meta-analysis that I conducted with some colleagues. And then in the second part of the talk, uh, provided there's time and I don't ramble on too much, I will be discussing some of my own empirical research studying resurrection plants in South Africa. So yeah, I'm going to begin by discussing um, our recent work describing the taxonomic representation and global participation in the 20 years of plant genome sequencing. And it has been 20 years since the first plant genome of Arabidopsis thaliana was published in 2000. And since then, the field of plant genomics has made amazing strides and, and we've really done some very exciting and groundbreaking work. So we set out to basically just summarize the, the field of plant genome sequencing and to understand what kind of progress we've made in the past 20 years and what the patterns are in terms of what's been sequenced and, and who's been doing the sequencing. So we scoured um, all these public repositories and review papers to identify as many genome assemblies as we could. And we found that there were genome assemblies available for nearly 800 different species of plants, which are shown here as individual points on this scatter plot. And now some species have been sequenced more than once, and there's multiple uh, reference genome assemblies available for these species, such as maize, Oryza sativa, Arabidopsis thaliana, soybean, etc. Whereas most other species have only had um, one individual uh, species sequenced. Um, now, a few things jump out at you from this graph. So, so as I said, each dot represents a, gene, a species with a genome assembly, and they're plotted over time against contig N50, or the contiguity of the assembly, which represents basically how continuously it is assembled. And, and so one of the things that jumps out at me right away is that we have the pace of plant genome sequencing has really accelerated in the past five years. So we are sequencing and assembling and publishing far more genomes today than we were just five years ago. And in fact, nearly three quarters of the available genome assemblies were produced in the last five years. Not only are we sequencing more genomes than ever before, but we're also producing higher quality genomes than ever before. With the contig N50 of genomes produced in the past five years is substantially improved to those produced in the preceding 15. This appears to be driven largely by the increasing use of long read sequencing technologies in these assemblies. So assemblies shown here in blue uh, incorporated some form of long read technology in their sequences. So for example, PacBio or Oxford Nanopore. And these were on average much higher uh, quality than those produced using only short reads like Illumina. So, Wow, we've sequenced a lot of plant genomes as a field, and I think that this is a really uh, exciting um, moment, and, and there's, there's no signs of, of our efforts and progress slowing down. So the next question that we wanted to ask was about what we've sequenced. So have we done a good job of sampling the whole breadth of the plant kingdom, or rather have we invested most of our efforts into particular taxa uh, and groups? So to understand this, we compared the number of genome assemblies that we would expect to see in every order of land plants um, against the number that we actually observed. And the way we calculated the number that we would expect was based on the species richness of that order. So what I'm showing you here along the left are all of the land plant orders, except for the bryophytes, which have been condensed into the phylum level. 
And then each of these blue bars represents the number of genome assemblies that we would expect to see had, had sequencing been effort been evenly distributed across taxa relative to the speciosity of those orders. Whereas the dark gray bars represent the number of genome assemblies that we actually observed for these taxa. And I think one of the first thing that pops out right away is that there's a number of orders that do not have a single reference genome assembly available. And then this is most prevalent with the ferns and the bryophytes, which are not really shown here. But there are also a number of orders of angiosperms that, that also lack a reference genome assembly. And among the orders of plants that do have available genomic resources, there's a very wide range of depth in terms of how many species have been investigated. We identified seven orders of vascular plants with a statistical overrepresentation of genome assemblies. And not surprisingly, this included many uh, economically and agriculturally important groups of plants, such as Solanales, Brassicales, Cucurbiteles, uh, Roseales. So these are groups that contain many of our crops and um, human important species. In contrast, we identified uh, four orders of vascular plants that had a statistical underrepresentation of genome assemblies, and these were generally groups that had less a direct relevance to humans, but were highly speciose, such as Asparagales and Asterelles and Polypodiales. So these analyses point towards um, pretty stark biases in, in our sequencing efforts towards uh, economically and agriculturally important crops. And, and certainly this makes a lot of sense. We tend to be interested in things that benefit humans or are related to humans, and we have made massive bounds in our understanding of plants and plant science through these efforts. However, this has come perhaps at the cost of surveying and cataloging the diversity of these other groups, um, and, and particularly of wild plants, which host a really uh, amazing chemical diversity with potential applications, uh, but are extremely underexplored and are also at threat of extinction now more than ever before. So we think that there's an opportunity here for, for us as a field to move towards sequencing some of these underrepresented groups. We also looked at um, assembly length as a proxy for genome size, and as well as the ploidy levels of, of the plants with available genomic resources. And we found that assembly size varies uh, considerably across the database. There's some massive genomes that have been sequenced and assembled, um, but that there are by far more diploid genome assemblies available than, than other um, ploidy levels. And, and certainly this makes a lot of sense because it has been really challenging um, to assemble high-quality polyploid genomes uh, until quite recently. But given the uh, improvements in technology and analytics, it is now becoming possible to sequence uh, and assemble high-quality polyploid genomes. And, and we hope that researchers are really pushing in this direction. <clears throat> As I showed you on the previous slide, contiguity or contig N50 varied considerably across the available genomic resources. And this does not seem to be related to the uh, taxonomic group of, of species, but rather to the types of reads that were used in constructing those assemblies, with long reads generally generating much more contiguous assemblies than, than short read assemblies. And finally, we looked at buscos. We looked at the percentage of complete buscos that were captured in these different genome assemblies. And buscos are like these single copy orthologs that are expected to be in, in all species. Um, and we found that the more contiguous genomes, uh, of course, captured a higher proportion of complete buscos. And again, these were those assemblies built with long reads. So you can just summarize by saying long reads seem to produce much more high quality genomes than, than short reads. So based on these analyses, we offered a couple recommendations to researchers in the field. And these are recommendations that we are embracing as well as individuals. Um, so the first recommendation is to really embrace long read sequencing technologies to generate new assemblies. 
and for sure this is already being done by, by most researchers in the field, but given the massive disparity in the quality of the resulting assemblies, uh, we think that the importance of really embracing these technologies cannot be overstated. And secondly, that uh, we should continue to seek to expand the taxonomic scope and representation of, of the species that we're sequencing. And in particular, that we should focus some attention on generating assemblies for uh, clades that have none, as well as for wild species, which are extremely diverse and relatively underexplored. And finally, for those species with complex and polyploid genomes. And, um, so these are some exciting directions that we can see the field heading, but I'm sure you guys all have your own ideas um, uh, to add to this list. So moving on, the next question that we were interested in investigating was um, who is doing the genome sequencing? So we have an idea of what species are being sequenced, but who's doing the sequencing and leading these projects? So to understand that, we looked at the uh, institution or the corresponding author that had submitted the genome assembly and we assigned the genome to that location. And what we found was pretty stark. We found that genome sequencing, uh, plant genome sequencing, has really been dominated by uh, the United States, Central Europe, and China, with over three quarters of genome assemblies having been led by a team in one of these three areas. So this is looking a little bit unbalanced, and it could be problematic in a couple of ways. Uh, the primary way that, that I think that this is problematic, or could be problematic, is that it may overlook the insights and the knowledge um, of huge swathes, swaths of people who, who are seemingly not really participating in, in this work. We also noticed that the pattern of where genomes are being sequenced and assembled really overlays uh, quite closely with the global distribution of wealth. So we find that genome assemblies are, are generally produced in affluent areas uh, in the global north. With China being a notable exception here, but China has, has absolutely made strategic investments into science and plant science in particular, which I think have propelled it to be a leader in this field. But in general, we see that genome sequencing is really being done in areas where there's a lot of resources and a lot of uh, national wealth. And we also wanted to point out that these patterns of wealth distribution that exist across the globe have really been driven in a large part by uh, the history of colonialism, which ultimately ended up extracting a massive amount of resources from colonized territories uh, particularly in the global south, and consolidating this wealth into the global north. And this is a big factor that determines the current state of wealth distribution across the world, and it seems to be having an impact in plant genomics. But it's not just about wealth. There's actually a long history of colonialism and plant science being linked together. And I think it's important that we take this time to acknowledge that our field uh, you know, it, it is connected uh, and, and has benefited in some ways from, from these colonial practices, or some of us in the field have benefited from, from this history. So scientific motivation uh, or scientific curiosity actually motivated many of the early colonial expeditions, and, and scientists and botanists among them were among some of the first uh, individuals to travel to colonized territories, where they would often catalog and name thousands of quote-unquote new species. Um, and, and we have a record of this because they would often use European surnames when naming these new species. And, and there's this really nice figure from Trisos et al. 2021 showing that uh, the frequency of bird species that carry a European surname as part of their Latin binomial is in fact highest, not in Europe where we might expect, but in South America, in Africa, and in Southeast Asia, um, which is really just provides a record of how pervasive this um, sort of colonial discovery uh, and renaming of species was. <clears throat> 
In this process, uh, seeds and botanical specimens and live specimens were collected and transported and housed in massive facilities and botanical gardens in Europe and the global north. And to this day, some of our most comprehensive and extensive botanical resources in terms of seed banks and botanical gardens are located in the global north. And so taken together, this really compounds the economic disparities in in really consolidating uh, scientific uh, resources and, and even prestige in the global north, which creates yet another barrier for uh, researchers working in the global south and in less affluent nations and institutions. So this is some of the history that we think describes the patterns we're observing in, in plant genomics today. But we wanted to dig a little bit deeper into this to try to understand um, whether or not species were being sequenced by foreigners or, or if projects were being led by people in the native range of these species. So to understand this, we compared the native distribution of all of the crops in our data set with the location of the team that led the sequencing of their genome. And I'll walk you through this figure. So what I'm showing you here, these circles represent the number of species that are native to the six different continents and are scaled by, um, by the number of species. The arrows emanating out of them are scaled by the number of genomes assemblies that were sequenced off continent by, by foreigners, basically. And, um, I think it's pretty obvious from this figure that a lot of off-continent sequencing has been going on. And while there has been some sort of reciprocal exchange of plant material between the, the North America, Europe, uh, and parts of Asia, we find that when it comes to South America and Africa, all of the crops that are native to, the, to these continents have been sequenced by teams that were led off continent. And so this could potentially, you know, be indicative of, of some problematic uh, issues. And I think it, it possibly diminishes the quality of the science that we're doing. So um, foreign researchers may not always uh, select the most relevant germplasm to sequence, and, and their analyses may not really reflect grower priorities in production regions. And, and moreover, foreign researchers may have a, a harder time communicating and sharing the results and their data back with the affected stakeholders. Um, so if, if a lot of off-continent sequencing is going on, it's possible that we're overlooking some, some important biology in these systems. In addition to the fact that we're, we're once again potentially consolidating scientific expertise in these few areas that are leading these projects. But to do our due diligence, we've, we've figured we really need to understand uh, whether or not collaborations are, are involved here, because it's possible these, sequen these projects are being led in the global north, but are really involving rich collaboration networks with people in, in the native region of the plant. So we looked at the affiliations of all co-authors on these publications, and what we found was that in the case of all of these projects where a species has been sequenced off-continent, and this has really only been done uh, in Asia, Europe, and North America, that <clears throat> only a very small percentage of these studies included even a single course, a co-author, from the native range of the species. So it's, it's maybe less than 25% of these studies included a collaborator um, from the native range of these species. And, and so we think this, this really suggests that we are overlooking um, affected individuals and, and really knowledgeable um, demographics in our work. And so I think this is sort of a call to action and, and just to say that that we can, as a field, probably do better in terms of inviting collaborations and, and really expanding participation. So to conclude this part of my talk, I'd like to leave you with a couple takeaway messages. Um, 
and, and I hope that this is the beginning of a really lively discussion in, in the field. So our work identifies a number of gaps, challenges, and, and inequities in plant genomics. And, and we argue that these are driven by historical forces of colonialism, and that they're probably perpetuated by some modern practices, not presumably not out of any malicious intent from individual researchers, but rather a sort of um, complacency in, in which we find that it's easier to operate in the system that's established. Uh, but I think that our work, what I've presented today, really points out that the system, the established system, is, is not equitable. And so we need to push back against these, these patterns and these inequities as individuals. So as I said, our work identifies a number of these challenges, but it, it really doesn't go very far in terms of developing solutions. And, and this is you know, what I think is really the important work, and it's a conversation that I'm excited to, to see springing up and to be involved in. Um, and, and I'm not an expert at all in this area, but some of the, the ideas that I have towards you know, building solutions and, and sort of breaking down um, some of these inequities and making our discipline more inclusive, uh, are as follows. So I think we should invest in building global genomics capacity through trainings, um, through technology transfer, the development of more portable and affordable sequencing technologies and platforms, which is happening, as well as investment in critical infrastructure in across the globe. So sequencing facilities, for example. Uh, in addition to this capacity building, I think that we really should work to uh, build strong intercontinental collaboration networks. And, and for sure, this is already being done by some motivated individuals, but I think our analysis points out that it is not being done by the majority. And so I think this is an area where we can improve. And this can be done on an individual level. As individuals, we can just try to be mindful of the signatures of colonialism and push back against them. We can try to invite meaningful contributions from diverse stakeholders in our systems, and we can really commit to sharing uh, our data in accessible and diverse formats. But more importantly, I think as a field, we can work towards institutionalized uh, systems that support and promote collaboration across continents. And I think consortia are a really exciting opportunity to do this work. And there's a lot of consortia popping up all the time to sequence all sorts of things, whether it be all plants, all butterflies, all vertebrates. And um, these big consortia uh, offer a really important opportunity to diversify the field and to invite con contributions from people across the globe. Professional societies can continue to support international collaboration and institutions and universities can also do this through exchange programs and legal documents that support collaboration and data sharing. So I would just say that um, to sum up this part of the talk that, that I'm really excited to, to hear everybody's ideas and feedback on, on these issues. And I think that, that we have arrived at a, at a point of reflection and perhaps inflection. And, and there's an opportunity to really broaden our discipline in a way that, that I think will elevate our science. And yeah, if you want to read more about our opinions and, and what we did and some of the analyses, you can check out our recent paper in Nature Plants, which covers the same material. <clears throat> okay, with that, I'm going to shift gears completely and um, spend the rest of my talk uh, discussing some of my empirical research studying resurrection plants in South Africa. And I've divided this part of my talk into two small vignettes. And I'm going to talk about two approaches that we've taken to trying to understand the mechanisms of desiccation tolerance in these organisms. The first approach 
looks at convergent evolution of desiccation tolerance across some really diverse species. And the second approach is much more targeted, where we look at natural variation within a single species um, to identify really targeted components of desiccation tolerance. So for me, this work is motivated by an awareness that um, we might, or many of us, might be living in an increasingly arid world uh, as time continues. And in order to make the most out of these arid biomes that we may be living in, it's, I think, important to have an understanding of these systems um, so that we can better manage them for sustainable utilization. And part of understanding these systems is to understand the biology of the organisms that naturally thrive in these biomes. And we can leverage this diversity not only to live uh, more sustainably in these landscapes, but also for crop improvement via biotechnology. So in the plant kingdom, there are a number of natural adaptations to deal with drought. Perhaps one of the most ubiquitous and successful of these adaptations is seeds, uh, which allow plants to really effectively weather periods of drought. But there are also a number of physiological adaptations that can improve water use efficiency and drought tolerance in plants. And one of these is called desiccation tolerance, which I'm showing you here on the bottom. And this is the ability uh, that some plants have to completely dehydrate their vegetative tissue down to about 5% relative water content without dying, such that when the first spring rains become available, these plants unfurl and resume photosynthesis and met metabolism within hours of rehydration. So this is a very successful adaptation to extreme drought, and it also has a lot of potential applications in biotechnology and, and crop science. Desiccation tolerance was thought to have evolved uh, nearly 600 million years ago and probably enabled the transition of early plants out of the aquatic environment and into the terrestrial environment. Throughout evolutionary time, desiccation tolerance was lost in the vegetative tissues of most vascular plants, probably as a trade-off for more advanced water management systems such as vasculature and stomata. Interestingly, desiccation tolerance was retained in most bryophytes, probably because they lack some of these other water management systems. So this is the distribution of desiccation tolerance across the land plant phylogeny. Each one of these blue family names represents a family that has desiccation tolerance in it. And so what you can see here, I think, is that desiccation tolerance is quite common among the early diverging lineages of mosses, liverworts, and hornworts. It becomes less common in vascular plants, and by the time we get into the angiosperms, the flowering plants, desiccation tolerance is really restricted to just a few select families. Desiccation tolerance re-evolved in these select families likely due to environmental selection uh, in these extremely arid habitats. And, and it's not uncommon to find resurrection plants or desiccation tolerant plants spanning almost 500 million years of evolution growing together in these closely intertwined communities. So here we can see a whole assemblage of resurrection plants from mosses, ferns, monocots, and dicots all growing together in this one habitat. And so this offers a really unique and promising system to investigate the processes of convergent evolution in a complex trait and to possibly pull out what the core mechanisms of tolerance are. Just to give you a little sense of what this habitat looked like, at least in southern Africa, a lot of the resurrection plants are growing on these rocky outcroppings or ruwaris, where they will exist in these small little clusters separated by uh, spaces of inhospitable terrain. So this probably impacts their ecology and their distribution. But as I said, many of these species tend to grow together. So we were interested in using these convergently evolved species uh, 
to try to identify and pull out the core mechanisms of desiccation tolerance. And we thought we could do this by uh, using publicly available data since there's been so much sequencing going on. And so we went out and we looked for all of the RNA-seq data that we could find of resurrection plants going through a dehydration and rehydration event. We gathered this data for 18 different taxa uh, across the phylogeny, the land plant phylogeny, and we included seven desiccation sensitive taxa for comparative purposes. We did a whole bunch of analyses to identify orthologous genes and summarize gene expression. And when we make a plot of sort of overall gene expression patterns, what we find is that there's a really high degree of species specificity in terms of gene expression. So each color represents a unique species, and what we see is that the samples from that species tend to cluster together. Um, and we don't identify any overarching patterns related to tolerance versus sensitivity or to different hydration statuses. So this could be occurring, this could be real biology that is occurring because these species are extremely diverse and given the evolutionary history of desiccation tolerance, it makes sense that they may have uh, species specific mechanisms to desiccation. However, because these are publicly available data sourced from a repository, there's a lot of experimental variation contained within this data set. So, most of these experiments were conducted by different researchers working in different institutions, labs, and locales, and so there could be a fair amount of, of variation between how these experiments were conducted. So we can't be totally sure if we're picking up on species specificity or experimental variation. So that's made these data a little bit challenging to work with. Uh, we did push forward though, and we conducted a number of differential expression and gene ontology enrichment analyses, and we were able to, to pull out some themes. But ultimately, we think this data set is not very well suited to answering um, our questions about the core mechanisms of tolerance. And um, so we decided that the solution to this problem uh, was to conduct one experiment one experiment to sequence them all. And yeah, so that's exactly what we're trying to do. Uh, during this last field season, I traveled to South Africa and identified at one of our sites, uh, 12 different resurrection plants all growing in close proximity to one another. This includes four grasses, three xerophyta species, which is another monocot, uh, the dicot, myrothamnus, a fern, a fern ally, um, a moss, a liverwort, and so this is really almost certainly the most diverse group of resurrection plants that, that has ever been studied uh, in a single study. And we're really excited to, to see the results um, from this work. And not only are these plants extremely diverse, but we're also really committed to doing this work in the field in natural conditions. And so uh, what I did was I just traveled to my field site and I sat there and I waited for it to rain. And once it started raining on Christmas night, I headed out to the field and began sampling plants uh, through the process of rehydration, through a period of relatively hydrated conditions, and then again as they dried down into this complete desiccation. And the ultimate goal with this experiment is to conduct um, a large-scale RNA-seq uh, gene expression study to look at uh, conserved patterns of expression across these individuals. But I've only collected these data a couple months ago, and so I don't have the RNA-seq data to share with you, but I will just show you a little bit of the field data, which tracks the relative water content of the species through this time course, as well as their photosynthetic efficiency. And so that's what I'm showing you here. Um, this is a graph of all 12 of the resurrection plants and the two desiccation-sensitive plants at the bottom. And it shows the changes in relative water content throughout the sampling period in red. So you can see most of the plants went through a big dramatic rehydration and then a drying event. And the blue line represents their photosynthetic efficiency, or FVFM, uh, which also uh, recovers through the time course and, and goes through huge fluctuation, but tends to lag behind relative water content to some degree. So anyways, stay tuned for the results in coming in you know, the next 
year to 10 years. <laughs> um, but no, seriously, I, I'm very excited about this experiment. I think it's got the potential to be pretty novel and cool. And, and um, yeah, I look forward to sharing more results with you guys in the future. So with that, I'm going to move on to the last section of my talk. It looks like I've got just a bit of time left. And I'd like to talk about our work using a different approach to identify tolerance enhancing genes and alleles. And this is to look at natural variation within a specific species. And this has the advantage of really minimizing all of that background noise that was confounding our cross-species comparisons. So this is an approach I've been thinking about and working with for a long time. Uh, my PhD work was devoted to looking at natural variation within uh, the tropical liverwort, Marchantia inflexa. And I'm not really going to share much about that work with you today, except to tell you that we did identify um, a fair degree of differences in desiccation tolerance among individuals or different populations of this species, and that they were linked to complex uh, patterns of gene expression. What I am going to share with you today is about my more recent work uh, trying to take a similar approach in Myrothamnus flabifolia, which is an angiosperm resurrection plant native to South Africa. So Myrothamnus flabifolia is a really, I mean, I'm biased, but it's a really beautiful plant. Um, it is a tall, shrubby plant, and it goes through this extremely dramatic process of, of rehydration during the spring rains. And for this reason, it's well known by local people across its native range. And it has, in fact, been used in traditional medicine by Sangomas uh, for hundreds of years for a whole diverse set of healing properties. In more recent times, uh, Myrothemis has actually uh, caught the interest of a number of entrepreneurs who are interested in using extracts from this plant to develop cosmetics and teas that you know supposedly help with healing and keeping your face looking young and fresh uh, and very resurrected. So as you can see, Myrothamnus stands at the intersection of a number of different interest groups. Um, and because this plant is extremely stress tolerant and it grows in these pretty uh, challenging environments on these rock outcrops, it tends to grow quite slow. And therefore, all of these competing interests in the plant um, do make it vulnerable to potential um, overharvest and population decline. So one of the goals with our work in this species, you know, in addition to understanding desiccation tolerance, is to uh, better understand the ecology so that we can help guide and inform uh, management practices to conserve uh, the species and protect it from overharvest. So for the current study, uh, I traveled to South Africa and established field sites across an environmental gradient. The idea, I think in my proposal, I said something crazy like I was going to establish 12 field sites across multiple countries, and, and that was pretty infeasible, and, and COVID really made it a lot harder. So we have ended up focusing on these three target sites in South Africa, um, but they do ex uh, cover a fair amount of environmental variation uh, and elevation, and they're about 500 meters, uh, uh, excuse me, kilometers apart. Um, at each of these sites, we've phenotyped hundreds of plants and tested for differences in desiccation tolerance and other life history and fitness traits. So one of the cool things about this work, as a side note, is that Resurrection plants often grow um, on vertical cliffs on these rock outcroppings. And so this was a sort of serendipitous and, and very synergistic opportunity for me to use my um, experience in rock climbing and rope access to finally do something practical. So I've spent far too many hours um, at the cliff rock climbing over the past 15 years. And you know it was really gratifying to finally have a use for these skills. And I, and I think it really justifies all of that time. So uh, that's been really fun. But back to, back to the science. Um, one of the first things we looked at was the environmental characteristics at these three study sites. And we did identify significant differences in a number of environmental uh, characteristics. So 
Buffelskloof is uh, significantly wetter, cooler, and higher elevation than the other sites, and, and Shwebi Shwebi is, is the driest, hottest, and uh, lowest elevation site. And, and these differences in environmental parameters combine to, to really create a perceptible feeling of a different environment in these sites. We looked at a number of different population and plant phenotypes, and we found that um, there's a lot of variation across, across the study area. So in this first panel, what I'm showing you is that the patches of myrothamnus, the small populations, if you will, um, were larger and more densely populated in the drier of the, of the sites. The plants in the drier sites were also taller, uh, suggesting that myrothamnus is really thriving in these arid uh, sites. In contrast, plants from the more mesic site grew significantly faster and also produced significantly more inflorescences, um, which is, is sort of what we would expect given that these sites um, are more mesic and there's more water available and more growing days for the plants in these sites. Um, but why this doesn't translate into larger plants and larger populations is an interesting question. And while we don't have data to, to clearly demonstrate this, it's my suspicion that competitive interactions in these mesic sites uh, really limit the establishment and the persistence of myrothamnus. So despite growing quite rapidly and, and flowering a lot, we find that these plants are actually not more successful and abundant. So, you know, the implications for harvest here are that Despite looking like, you know, really abundant and large populations in these uh, dry areas, these plants are also growing very, very slowly. So uh, it's, impo it's important to, you know, have limits on what can be harvested annually. Um, I don't think I have time to talk about the sexual dimorphisms, but we did pick up on some interesting differences between male and female plants that I'd be happy to talk about in, in the question section if, if anyone's interested but I'm just gonna keep moving on now. So the next step in this work was to uh, quantify desiccation tolerance and test for differences across these three sites. And so we looked at three traits related to desiccation tolerance and recovery. We looked at the relative water content of plants collected dry in the field. We looked at the percentage of tissue that recovered from these desiccated uh, events. And we looked at how rapidly this tissue rehydrated. And what we found was that there were no significant differences in any of these traits across the study area, suggesting that um, myrothamnus maintains high levels of desiccation tolerance even in the most mesic sites. And this is probably due to positive selection on tolerance because drought events do still occur in these more mesic areas. So while this is not exactly what I was hoping to find, um, it is an interesting finding in and of itself, and it, and it shows that while uh, desiccation tolerance is maintained at high levels, other phenotypic traits can vary around that, suggesting that it's not a hard and fast trade-off between desiccation tolerance and growth, for example. And um, yeah, so, you know, I'm going to continue pursuing these questions in a different uh, study system in Microchloria cafra, uh, but we're not done with myrothamnus. And um, we're continuing to work with this species, and I'm hoping that, that in addition to helping inform uh, management and harvest guidelines, uh, that our work can really uh, provide resources for this valuable species. And, and so part of that work is generating a genome assembly, uh, as well as uh, a bunch of RNA-seq data for myrothamnus, and I won't describe the assembly um, because it's still in progress, but I will just say that, um, of course, we're including a lot of South African collaborators in this work, and that the project will be, be led and directed by a team out of the University of Cape Town. And we're really committed to trying to share our, our findings uh, with all of the stakeholders in, in this system and, and, and really invested in science communication around this project. So stay tuned. And um, lastly, I just always like to end my talks by acknowledging um, the many different setbacks and challenges and, and even failures that I have experienced in doing this work. Uh, for example, 
One of the things I was hoping to do was to propagate myrothamnus from cuttings and grow them in a common garden to screen for genetic differences in tolerance. But of the 300 or so cuttings that I tried to propagate, not a single one took. Sometimes you have other challenges, like it doesn't rain when you need the rainfall, and you have to get creative and come up with solutions to uh, solving these challenges. Um, so yeah, I just bring these up uh, in an effort to try to normalize the fact that there are challenges and failures. And, and I think for all of us early career researchers, it's really nice to hear that um, we're not alone. I, I hope I'm not alone in, in this experience of, of challenges and failures. And, and it's really about persistence in the long term and a commitment to quality. So with that, um, I will conclude. I will thank you so much for your time, for coming and listening to me ramble on for about an hour. Um, and I'd also like to just acknowledge that, that this work would not have been possible without the support of my mentors in South Africa and in the United States, as well as the efforts uh, of my teams in those two locales. And of course, big thanks to NSF for funding my work. And um, yeah, with that, I'd, I'd be really happy to take questions. <laughs>